outro cast. Well, aside from having to talk to me, is your day going fine so far? <laughs> Day's going good. I am in um, Phoenix, or not Phoenix right now. Well, near Phoenix, Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, we're going to play a show tonight, so yeah. <laughs> You are on tour supporting the record. Now, when somebody sees you live these days, how much of the new record do they get versus other material? Uh, honestly, this is a tour around entirely the new record. So they get the whole thing. <laughs> they get the whole record. Yeah. And I love your music. Now, now I'm putting that out there right, right there and forward. And I first found out about you through just watching Facebook videos of you playing improvised stuff. So when I saw that there was a covet album coming out, it's, it's like, oh, cool, that too. Now, for you to record an album like this, how many songs did you actually demo or write for us to get the final track listing? Uh, everything. Um, I mean, I feel like this this album came out of me doing a bunch of pedal demos. Um, over quarantine, I just had a lot of time to actually sit down and be creative and write. And mm -hmm. I just kind of bunkered down and uh, wrote out the whole record in entirety. And de I, like before we went to the studio, the whole thing was demoed. Maybe aside from the piano thing, the piano thing I kind of improvised mm -hmm. um, in the middle of the recording process because I thought we needed to transition. So yeah, a lot of it was planned out, but you know, things never go according to plan. <laughs> Right. That was actually going to be one of my questions. With demoing, does the lead part come first or does it get developed later on? For me, I usually start with guitar and I build out like the, the lead guitars and then all the backing stuff. Like um, there's some textural ambient things and there's some like tremolo picking parts and some like additional mm -hmm. chuggy chords to reinforce the main part. Uh, that's all added afterwards. But everything is pretty much planned out before I hit the studio, all parts recorded. And as you mentioned, some of it came out of tone or pedal demos. So in your case, does the tone factor into the composition? Uh, you said it did the tone? Yeah, because some, okay, giving a random example, the band Rancid is a punk band where everything's electric, yet Tim Armstrong writes everything on an acoustic guitar. And I find that sometimes you find with harder rock bands, they don't write on anything but acoustic. So in your case, does the tone factor into the composition? Oh, it's 100% integrated and I'm thinking about it concurrently with the melody. If anything, the melody is informed by the tone. Um, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the songs on this record were inspired by pedal demos. So in these demos, I'm not trying to juxtapose a melody over a sound and have it be forced. Like mm -hmm. when I demo a piece of gear, I'm really trying to think like, how can I write a melody to really let the, the sound of it shine and really like showcase what the pedal can do. Um, and I like that because it ends up making me write a lot differently. It's mm. almost like being given a new color. And, you know, what you draw with black might be way different than what you end up drawing with red. So you never know. Oh. And sometimes the song is instrumental. Sometimes it has you singing. Is mm -hmm. that a thing that's decided towards the end after the riff and the tone have been figured out? Um, sometimes I'm like, definitely... Uh, I write the whole song instrumentally first and I'm like, oh, it's missing something. I hear a vocal line. But then sometimes I feel like I haven't really done this with Covet, but with my personal stuff, I've written like a catchy vocal line and then I write guitars around it. Got it. So song by song. And then do you know outright this is a Covet song? This is an Yvette solo song? Um, yeah, I think so. I think Covet's more like shoegazy like post-rock heavy and then I feel like for me I'm working on like a more poppy kind of songwriter singer songwriter album that still has technical guitar but I want it to be a, like a little more vocal so after this tour I think I'm gonna go home and like incubate on that cool well going back to the early days of Yvette what I'm curious about is did you play in garage bands like did you have a bad high school band that did covers I never did cover. Well, I did covers in the privacy of my own room in college. Um, that's actually when I really started diving into writing music and stuff. But I, I first started out learning American football toe covers. Um, I did a couple of uh, the first song I ever learned was a Creed song, actually. Um, 
which is pretty great. Six feet from the edge. Great riffs, honestly. Um, yeah. yeah, I, uh, and then I had a garage band back in the day in Glendale. It was like my first time playing with anyone else and it was really fun. Um, and then Covet actually started as a garage band thing and I, it just picked up a lot of steam and I quit my teaching job to kind of do it full time because I had to tour all the time and I was like, oh, right. I'm young, I might as well give it my all and see what happens. And here I am in a random Airbnb in Scottsdale, Arizona. So what I'm hearing is there was no early days of shredding. Uh, meaning the technical guitar always came tastefully when you're talking about Owen, you know, Kinsella being a big influence on you. It wasn't like you said, Van Halen into the indie rock. Yeah, I, I feel like I just discovered like Van Halen, <laughs> like, and then, you know, the, all of that came later. I, I kind of just like listened to a lot of like emo punk bands growing up, a lot yeah. of post a lot of folk, actually. I started on acoustic, so it was a lot of like... Um, I don't know, Sufjan Stevens, kind of uh, Cat Steven, all the Stevens. Um, oh, Steve all the Stevens. Stevens? Yeah, Steve, Steven Seagal. I'm just kidding. Um, Have you ever heard the Steven Seagal solo albums, by the way? Yeah. <laughs> He's yeah, such a fascinating person. Oh, I, I can go hours on Steven Seagal YouTube of his yes. claims in life. It's great that if... Uh, one of them is that he was playing in an all black band in the 1950s in Detroit. And you go, you were born in like 53. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> I love that. He also like, when he claims to like be like in the Navy or something. And then he's, I read something horrific where he wanted to save animals. Like there was like, a, I think like a cockfighting ring and he was like, I'm going to go bust it. And so he decided to roll up in a tank, but he ended up killing like everything at this place because he rolled up in a tank yeah like yeah this guy's nuts and his music and he has an energy drink called like yeah I, yeah it's i've i saw it on ebay for like 500 dollars a bottle i'm like uh, i can't justify that but one of the flavors is called asian sensation and it's just um interesting to know that i guess someone can experience my lived experience as an Asian woman just by drinking a can of his energy drink, so. Well, depending on the interview, he explains that he's Mongolian Russian with, with Asian heritage. He or is not Asian, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, well, Sensei Seagal has taught us well. Well, more, more related to you. Did you ever see the video where Steven Seagal shows off his guitar collection and they're all spread out on his lawn? No. Oh my God. I would please email me that. Cause that would be incredible. Okay. I, I'm curious to see if you agree with me that you do not put guitars on the ground and leave them there. That's the first question. And the second question is when he says the particular guitars belong to BB King, if you agree with me that he bought a BB King model, went to a BB King show, got it signed and went, it's BB King's guitar. We'll, we'll have to figure that one out later. Oh my God. And then he just puts it on the ground. Like, yeah sick um and say yeah. Seagal well I think if Sensei Seagal had a favorite band it would be Covet myself oh you should get him on the show <laughs> I, I actually did try and they told me that he is busy working for Vladimir Putin as a special peace envoy mission person so no. I'm, I'm sorry at this time Mr. Seagal will not be appearing on the Paltrow cast but you are and how far, bringing it back to you, uh, how far in advance are you planning your career? For example, do you know about touring at the end of the year? Do you know about the next album? My whole year is planned out for me at the beginning of the year. And I've been trying to plan a, a break for a long time because I think for creatives, if you're always on the road, if you're always going, 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 you have no time to really write and also no time to, for lack of a better expression, replenish your soul and like, yeah. you know, fill up and I feel like I'm running on empty and I have been for it not to be emo but like I feel like I've been really exhausted for a while and I need yeah. to just go go away and write and do the thing you know because like I got into guitar not because I wanted to be a professional guitarist and play in a band like for me it was completely an outlet and it was like my way of surviving um and mm -hmm. hearing him you know finding a way to make it a career and that's really cool and all but 
I think to maintain the integrity of what I do and to preserve the passion that I have for it, like I have to take breaks and really figure out, um, you know, how I'm going to balance my schedule a little better. So I have time to recover and um, be creative and experiment and do all the things that artists love to do. I hear you. I totally hear you on that. And it sounds like putting the guitar in your hands is the easy part. It's just finding the energy and the motivation to just keep doing it every day when you know that you have the six hour van ride and the 25 emails to deal with and the four interviews. That's what kind of makes it hard. The music's the easy part. Yeah, I'll always start music. I think it's also just like there's something that happens when you start doing it for a living where it's like expectation is put on you and, you know, people want you to make money for them and stuff. So they just like, they're like, write a song and you start doing it from like a utilitarian perspective rather than like, I think most good art comes from a place of just experimentation and and expression. And you can't like squeeze these things out on a timeline. Like you can find a way to like, manufacture mm -hmm. or even mass produce it with the thing with with the help of ai um but i think there's something to be said about you know um to keep something fresh and to keep yourself writing the art that you genuinely want to write um and not cater to anyone else you have to like make time for just writing music for fun and for the sake of writing music and not to like fulfill a deadline or you know make money <laughs> that makes sense well Two, two more questions and then I will let you roam free. And the first one is your new records on Triple Crown Records and mm -hmm. growing up on Long Island, New York. I first learned about Triple Crown when I think brand new was the hot shot signing. Mm -hmm. And then we saw Fred kind of take it into this Warner incubator label. When did you first learn it into, when did you first learn about Triple Crown? Um, I went to record in Long Island and it just kind of made sense to like keep everything East Coast. Like my whole team is East Coast. Uh, so yeah, that was kind of how that happened. <laughs> I, uh, I really like Caspian. I grew up listening to Caspian a lot and they're on Triple Crown. Got it. So you mentioned emo a few times and it is a label that for better and for worse broke emo in a good way. So I guess good company. And the last question I have has nothing to do with how great you and COVID are. Did I just say COVID covet? You just said COVID is great. <laughs> COVID is also great, uh, not just COVID. Uh, besides COVID and your solo career, television, what are you watching these days? What do you recommend? I actually don't really watch TV. I never grew up with TV. I'm pretty much like a pop culture. I live in a pop culture vacuum. Um, I, for some reason, I know a lot about Steven Seagal. Uh, I watch so you're not in a YouTube vacuum. That's what I'm learning. I do watch, I like comedians, some of my favorite comedians right now, Connor O'Malley. He's like the chaos that I wish I could be. Um, we just had Eric Grayhill and Jack Benzinger at a show. They're really cool. Um, I, oh, I love Tim Robinson. Like his show, I think you should leave is incredible. Nathan Fielder, another great one. Uh, the rehearsal's insane. Nathan Free is insane. Um, yeah, I think I just watch a lot of comedy because I'm trying to laugh, you know? I get it. Tim Robinson is one of the greatest discoveries that Saturday Night Live did not pick up on, right? Uh, yeah, they they fucked up. He's great. I'm so happy he's doing his own thing, though, and I cannot wait for the new season of I Think You Should Leave. Amen to that. Well, thank you for your time. Hope to see you live in New York in the near future. Hope to get new music soon, and just thank you for being an original voice in guitar, a tasteful technical guitar player. I appreciate that, Darren. Thank you so much. Outro cast.